Um, we're now going to talk about can we get trust in the public? And we're going to have some international perspectives. Um, I'm just assuming, I'm going to take this opportunity, that trust requires, do I say, an old-fashioned phrase that some of you may have heard about, accounts that were true and fair. Um, and that's the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But we're going to hear how other people see it from uh, um, our first speaker will give us a perspective from Pakistan. Nadia Nasi name uh, is an independent consultant and chair of the subcommittee of public sector for ACCA in Pakistan um, and will give us a perspective. You can see everybody's full CVs in the pack so I'm assuming as accountants you can read and write and therefore I don't have to read it to you. Um, Stephen has been touring the, well, most of Africa uh, as a public finance uh, professional, helping uh, the IMF get the message through to various governments. He'll be coming on second. He's uh, uh, another ACCA member um, and a public sector uh, global finance uh, active member. We also have uh, Paul Moxie, who... Uh, I suppose we could call him an honorary uh, global uh, public sector global forum member, but really he's coming from the corporate governance and risk management side. He's a leading man uh, and expert on those subjects at the ACCA. So, um, and he is our well, a te technical lead. He's helping us because he's filling it in at short notice because a research that he's done or is about to complete, it will come online next year uh, and it will embrace how we can rebuild trust in the financial sector through our reporting mechanism. Lawrence Evans uh, most probably got stuck in transport on his way from New Zealand. We don't know what's actually happened to him. So there has been a change in the <coughs> order of things, you might have gathered that um, although Paul's stepping in, he's English and he can't do a New Zealand accent, so it will be in English. And to much ado, I would expect all the speakers to introduce themselves and you'll give a warm welcome to our panel and Edia to start. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Gillian, and everyone else for having me here. Um, I've been invited to provide the developing world's perspective on whether enhanced financial reporting can effectively um, influence public trust and um, whether that influence will be positive or negative. So we'll be looking on that and I'll be basing my talk on my experiences in Pakistan. Um, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is how the developing world really differs from the developed world in terms of governance. and. Um, so you see we're at the right side of the spectrum, and um, I assume most of you here will relate to the left side. Um, and because of this vast difference in the quality of governance, um, the, the priority for, for, for governments and for the public um, in terms of uh, governance in developing countries like Pakistan is, has not really reached financial reporting and disclosure. We're still in uh, grappling with building our systems and our uh, human resources, um, and with educating our public to be equipped enough to understand the information being presented to them before we can look at the quality of that information and whether it should be uh, in a different format and so on. Um, so that is not to say that financial reporting improvements are not an important subject, um, but um, I'll get on to that later. Um, before I can come to that, I'd, I'd like to talk about public trust and the level of public trust in Pakistan. And um, unfortunately, we don't have barometers um, or public opinion surveys in my country. So it's, it's really very hard to objectively say what is the level of public trust. Um, it's, um, I could say it's very negative because everybody's always um, complaining about the government, but then you'd say the same for your country. So, <laughs> so, so you know, to objectively say that is really very, very hard. Um, but around this time last year, I did a case study on um, the system of zakat, which is a, 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 an Islamic form of charity. And um, the interesting thing about zakat is that it's, um, uh, it can be distributed privately 
um, or it can be given to the government and then they can distribute it uh, via their centralized program. So, um, so I'm going to use this case study to, um, to answer or attempt to answer two questions. The first one being, um, does the Pakistani public trust its government for effective zakat administration? And I'll sort of take a parable to that up regarding how much public trust there is in the government and in its um, organizations. And then I'll talk about um, whether the disclosure of um, financial reports and public availability of financial reports really plays a significant factor in, in building and winning public trust towards various organizations. So just to quickly introduce the card, because it's a different subject and, and not very widely known, it's, um, it's an obligation upon financially able Muslims to give a specific amount of their wealth to the poor and needy, and it can be given, as I said, privately or through the government. Um, Pakistan is 95% Muslim population, so as you, you can imagine, that's a really big uh, source of welfare spending um, that we're talking about there. So um, I'll, I'll give a little bit of background about why, why welfare spending is, is important. Um, poverty is a really pressing issue in Pakistan because 60% of its population is still living under $2 a day. And um, um, a, a report in 2009 by Shirazi and Amin estimated that if administered properly, zakat collection in Pakistan would be between 1.57 to 4.31% of GDP. Um, their report also estimated that additional resources to the value of 1% of GDP can eliminate poverty under one25 dollars a day in Pakistan, whereas resources equivalent to 6.77% of GDP can eliminate poverty under $2 a day. So um, these estimates really would suggest that if the state optimized its collection and disbursement of zakat in Pakistan, there would be an end to poverty under $1 a day in Pakistan. Um, that is quite an assertion, really. And um, um, I, I, I would say um, that other studies are, are a little less optimistic about um, that kind of scope of um, of zakat for poverty alleviation, but almost all agree that um, that that in a Muslim majority a country like Pakistan, a lot can be done um, for poverty allevi alleviation through effective centralized zakat administration. Um, the problem is that a majority of the funds um, that are collected, uh, or rather, um, a majority of the people prefer to uh, distribute their zakat personally, privately, uh, whether to individuals or through different um, charitable organizations in the private sector, or rather in the third sector. So um, the reason that the car funds are not reaching the government's program is mainly, I would say, due to a lack of public trust in the government sector and specifically in its program of the car. Um, repeated scandals of corruption, embezzlement, and misappropriation have really tainted the program's image to a point where, um, besides 